Hello, live streamers. Okay, here we go. I'm Harold Vance. Um, I haven't been everywhere, but pretty close. I thought it was kind of cool how um, Mr. Allen said this would be a good topic. So I don't know if you guys know who Jeff Mack is, but he's really the spin of this whole thing. And uh, he wrote a little jingle that talks about it. We'll do a quick look at I've that. Been everywhere. This is well, I was humping my bluey. On the dusty Udna Data Road when along came and enough of that. With a high and so these are kind of the places that I've been and it's kind of the everybody has a different spin and a different flavor on it. So I kind of started down the path at a little company called Voxale Labs that was spun off from Voxale. They wanted to uh, do some CPAS stuff. Before that they were doing a lot of IVR and a lot of uh, stuff down that road. So Voxale Labs was around close to a year before they converted to Tropo. The cool thing about it was kind of the products that were there back then, and this is probably 10 years back, eight years back, somewhere in there, they had three kind of products. Phono, which is WebRTC, Tropo, which was built off of Adhesion Prism, and then Amici, which was the product that was going to revolutionize the world. Um, with a bunch of stuff which, which layered on the open source rail. So the good thing about a lot of the CPAS things out there, a lot of them are on open source and those capabilities to be able to use it which make, makes it nice. But at the end of the day it was really the commercialization of these products that brought CPAS to the market. Then after that, you know, this big old bridge called Cisco bit and swallowed up Tropo and we became Cisco. So I was there for quite a while um, doing the same type of things, helping them convert over. Then a little company called Telestacks, which had a thing called Rescom. It's a complete Java stack, pretty cool stuff. They actually had kind of the, one of the first white labeled products that excited me. And then uh, on to SignalWire, the, the FreeSwitch guys. So they created some APIs and created a commercial version of FreeSwitch that they uh, use today. And they're using some underlying strategies similar to Rayo to do their APIs as well. And then on to VoIP innovation, the excitement about that was here is a showroom that is 100% white labeled and you can change the colors and everything on it which made it nice and it was a VoIP company that sold numbers and they bought Apides to lay on top. So I was excited there as well. So what I do well is ideation. I'm not going to go through the definition of it but it's really where a lot of you guys, especially if you're starting out or even if you're successful today, it starts with that idea and it starts with kind of that spark that helps lead you through it. That's really one of the things that makes me as successful as I am because that's what I try to do every day. I try to find something new or what can we do to take what we have today to solve a workflow issue or a consumer problem so that you're saving money, you're getting the right information to people. So it can be a, a sundry of things and APIs do that. So what doesn't work? This is always a, a fun slide because, you know, if you think about it, there's nothing up here that probably you guys don't get. So build it and they will come. Well, build it and they will come works to an extent, but at the end of the day, why don't you get some groundswell first, go out and socialize it, do some meetings, and find some people that would help you take your, your basically your roadmap and accelerate it. So. The things that I found successful about that was roadmap acceleration. So if I have a customer that has a need and we do have it on a roadmap but it might be two or three years down the path, how can we get them to uh, help assist us in having the monetary ways and means of getting it on? So that's kind of the way that I saw that made it better. Uh, analysis paralysis. So like anything else, if you go in and dig in and you find what you need to do, every now and then you'll get somebody that wants to go even further and further and further. Next thing you know, the product's not live. You've missed the boat. Somebody else is already doing it. And a lot of times um, the house doesn't get built. Nobody grabs the product and away you go. And you're going, you know, I wish I should have, could have. Last one, AI developers. So at the, the, the thing for me for all developers, they... Um, they may think they know what their microcosm is, but a lot of times they're really not out there talking to the industry and talking to the people. So their ideas need to be germinated and planted and talked. So the, the, the good thing for that and the, the better way to do that is to 
provide usable sample code. So whenever you're going to release something, make sure that you have this available. Make sure there's release notes, or at least if you can do pre-release notes, it's nice, but nobody likes pre-release, especially if you come back and say, oops, it didn't make it. But honesty, integrity really goes a long way. So if you can do that, that's great. And what's even better is if you can have products that are available that they can self-demo and they have the capabilities to go out and see it and maybe a sneak peek at the code beneath it if it's not proprietary. So if you're using API, a lot of the scripting and things that you put together, you should or you would want to do it if you're a pure API play. And my favorite one, because this is everybody from Microsoft to everybody in the world, make sure the beta testers know they're beta testers. Too many times things will get released and everybody goes, well, no, it's rock solid, and then something pops up. There's always those things that pop up, but just tell them, hey, you know, this is a new release. We've had it out and limited. We've done our test harness on it. It seems to be fine, but let them know that. Let them know that it hasn't been in the industry for three or four years. Talk about your roadmap on how you got there so that the trust that they gain is based on the fact of your record on bringing things to market. So what does work? The first one's pretty quick and easy. Transparency. A lot of times, because I in, in, in the in the places I fit in all those organizations, I was pretty much customer success. So I had pre-sales solutions architects all the way out to support and some inside sales teams. And so right up front, as long as you're honest and humble and talk with your customer, kind of um, allow them to be in the discussion, be part of the discussion, tell you what their needs are. Um, try to make sure you find all those, if you talk, think about a SWOT analysis, make sure you have everybody from the hard hitters to the naysayers as you're building and producing things and talking with them. That way you can dispel any myths and really help them come along the way and it really does take care of things. Because at, at the end of the day, you are there to make money and that chasm doesn't cross by itself, and you do have to take risks. That's, that's part of what you guys do and what everybody does. Make sure that you celebrate your customer successes. So make sure that you're there. Um, some of the metrics I look at from customer success are time from we get the lead to the time we sell, from the time we sell to the time they sign, from the time they sign to the time they deploy, from the time they deploy to the time they first use it, but that's important, but the best one is when they really use it. So when they hit that ROI, so when they're doing and moving all the traffic over to what you have talked with them about and they have fully deployed it. Another good point is to think about people trained or people that have been brought in and mentored on how the product works and what the functionality is gonna be. The more adopters in that company of your product, the better the chances of success you're gonna have especially if you get into uh, like a, an AT&T, because the left hand and the right hand generally don't know even who they are. I ran into that back in the day, trying to uh, get approval for open source code. Uh, it was like, um, it, was, it was worse than anything. But finally got the right guy in big data that said, oh, we do that all the time. Here's the form. Boom. Away we go. Address your development communities. So open form, make sure it is monitored make sure people can get a hold of you, make sure there's somebody there that can answer. I don't know how many times in early days of CPAS where I'd put a question out there and it would be weeks, months. I still have with one of the companies I'm not going to name that I worked for, as I came on board, I had to load their whole product, well, most of them I had to load the product and make a working demo. And uh, I've, had, I've got a question on one of them from about four years back that's still open. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know... I probably because they knew who I was and they probably just decided not to answer it, but they should have deleted it at least. Um, you know, eat your own dog food, so use your own product. People love that. So one of the things that I try to do at each of these is create my own IVR, um, just do a quick, simple thing. Maybe it's uh, as simple as, hey, send a text message to me, and then I send a menu back that says press 1 for my business card, press 2 for where I'm at, press three for my numbers, or press four to connect to me. So just, just simple things, just simple things. So I, I always encourage, and what I've done at, at the jobs as well, even when I was at Cisco, is let's train the sales team 
they don't have to write code, but once you write a piece of code for them, a script for them, make it so that they know where they can change it up. So maybe it's when it reads the customer's name. So when you're going in, show them a, like a mini disaster recovery where it's as simple as they either dial in or they text in, and it brings back the name or says the name of the company. And that's all they got to modify, and then it can jump in and modify it on the fly. It goes over big. A lot of times, if sales can't do that, they got a sales engineer, then they're not thinking that grandma can code it, even though we don't want grandma to code it. And the hardest one is communication. For some reason, people don't, uh, don't know that it's as simple as picking up the phone and uh, just saying, hey, how's it going? Uh, as you grow your business and as you're growing the customer success side of the house, just a 10 minute call every month to say, hey, let's touch base. They don't have to come to the call every month, but it's just nice to do it. Now you're gonna have to decide how you monetize that. So you gotta think about, um, is it the top 10 customers? Is it the customers that we wanna cross the chasm with? So you do have to make a decision because you don't wanna hire 100 of these guys to do this. You wanna make sure that you're going after the select ones that are gonna make you very successful. Of course, the thing that everybody loves, the next great ideas. I am one of those crazy guys that likes white label products that you can go out and change the color schemes and everything on, but too many times it falls short. It's really not there. Um, can products are great, uh, scripts great, templates are great. As long as you can kind of add those and provide those, it really helps out a lot. If not, you're gonna have to rely on the developers and the developers within the communities of the functions that you're at to make yourself successful, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, there's been a lot of great stuff discovered from the developer side on up, but really to penetrate the market and get your market share, you need to make sure that you're going through the path of including and getting them all involved on in that. So I always love the term CPAS, UCAS, we all SAS. So if you think about it, CPAS, what is CPAS? Some say it's communication platform as a service. Some say it's collaboration platform as a service. And it depends on what you're selling of, of how you spin it. The UCAS side of the house, you know, what I've seen over the years um, with the companies I've worked with is a lot of UCAS is now coming to CPAS to fulfill their IVR needs or to fulfill their, their, their text capabilities and to be able to tie it into other products like um, you know, Facebook and uh, WeChat and, and things like that. And so really and truly, the names are names. I think the best slide I've ever seen on this uh, that had a CPAS title showed an iceberg. And of course you have 20 to 30% above water and 70% below. And then you have all the, the CAS terms or the SAS terms attached to it. Because they kind of all fit together. They're API driven, they're web enabled, they're cloud. And so at some point in time, how, how are we gonna work together? I remember back in the day where we wanted that consolidated desktop where it was one application, everything's on. Well, cloud kind of gives that to you because with APIs, you can pull them into a centralized web app that enables you to do it. And then now you're connecting disparate systems through APIs. So we're accomplishing it. And we're accomplishing it in a, a, a much better way because now you're always going to have different products in different companies and different mixes and different countries. So why not embrace that and make sure that you can plug in wherever you need to plug in. My favorite terms, IoT, AI, ML, IL, and SL. So it's interesting because even back in the day when, when we were doing speech to text, you always had a library. Nobody wants to talk about the libraries because libraries are labor intensive, somebody has to set them up. But guess what? As we grow and as we go, now those become more and more and more usable and you get the capabilities of relying on others' work and step on their shoulders. With AI today, and I've seen quite a few of them, they all start out labor intensive because you have to figure out those intents. You gotta figure out what are you looking for what is, how is the customer reacting to you? Is it with a message? Is it with a voice? And then from there, you have to have the kind of the response library, the S library, where you're coming back and sh suggesting to them or responding to them. So it could be RL or SL. 
And so that's really the power there. Now, once we get to that point where true machine learning is taking it and grabbing it, to me right now, it's, it, the better parts of those are the ones that are spitting out the reports that says this didn't work or this missed the mark. So you're still tuning a bit. You're tuning the code and doing it. I'm excited about it. First time I spoke about AI was back in 1998 at a call center demo show, and I was talking about IVR and the fact that are you talking to a person or is that an automatron, as we called them back in the day. And it's just hilarious because we're there. We've been there for a little bit. It's not 100%, but think about offloading your traffic and the percentage there and what the savings is there. So just to do a couple of quick case studies, um, these two are, they're not similar by any means, but they're big companies. Four minutes, I can dance. So the first one, American Airlines, so the big company up there, I'm not gonna say the bridge company, but American Airlines was slowly moving away from their products, a lot. And so the team came to us and talked with us about, hey, I wonder if there's anything we can do because we're part of the, that team. So we sat down and said, well, you know, I wonder if they've thought about this, this, and this with APIs. So a two-day workshop is a great thing to do. You just kind of schedule it with the company. You come in and talk with them what you got, make sure they have the people in from the different departments that can tell about their troubles. Well, for us, the biggest one was, you know, when you're on an airline and they don't get the bags or they don't pre-check, they're getting better at it now, but wouldn't it be nice if you had IoT where you're taking a camera and looking at the bags as they're going on, and when you guesstimate that you're at that point, you go ahead and check every bag past that mark. They loved it. They're like, you know, that, that could save us 15 to 30 minute flight delays on some of the bigger flights. It was those type of things. So the, the next thing we know, we're invited to American Airlines API event that they do every year down in San Antonio where we could provide our APIs and help their developers use it to build their own stuff. American does a lot of internal building themselves and uses a lot of developers. Philips, same type of thing weren't using the, the phones and the system from the company. They're like, what are we gonna do? We lost so much share there, but we still want them as a, cu a customer. Well, they wanted to do some medical devices and they wanted to be able to do chat. They wanted to do conferencing, they wanted to do messaging. So we stepped in and talked and next thing you know, there's a contract where they hadn't had a contract in five years. So as much as people may say that CPAS and APIs don't really help on these bigger companies, they really do. They kind of give you that extra latch so as you bring it back in, you get the trust again, and then now you can do your big sale. That's it for me today. I would have played the music a little more for you, but I know we're on a tight schedule. Excellent, thank you so much, Harold. A round of applause, please.